Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, this is the Oracle Machine Learning Office Hours Usage Highlight, uh, Machine Learning Recommendations for Maintenance and Repair. So Lee Sacco is going to be presenting that. Um, and uh, myself, Sherry, and Mark, uh, we're going to be uh, supporting for any Oracle Machine Learning questions. And if you guys have questions about what Lee is presenting, uh, please make sure to put that in the Q&A. And then I'm pretty sure by the end of his presentation, uh, he can tackle those questions, okay? So thank you very much, Lee, for joining today and uh, take it away. Hey, thank you for having me. Um, welcome everybody to the session. Uh, as you can see, the session is machine learning recommendations for maintenance and repair. Um, but I realized that we've, we've really only got 30 minutes. And in fact, if we wanna do Q and A and live demo, we have less than 30. And that's not nearly enough time to cover both maintenance and repair. So today the, the focus I think will be on repair with the idea that maybe we can leave maintenance for another day if there's enough interest in it. Um, but again, as I said, I'm, I'm gonna try to go a little bit quickly to leave space at the end because we have live application here that we can go dive into and, and you can take a look at it and you can tell me where to click and what to do and ask whatever questions you want. So hopefully that sounds good and, and everybody is in the session that they'd hoped they were supposed to be in. Here is a message from Oracle's lawyers welcoming you to this presentation and reminding you not to buy any Oracle products based on anything I say. Just by way of introduction, uh, I, I have to start with a confession, which is that I am not really a data scientist, um, which may be not so ordinary for, for people speaking in this, this time slot. Um, but long ago, when I was back in university, I got a degree in AI and machine learning. Um, but back in the 1990s, when that was, the only jobs for people that had cognitive science degrees were as professors or, or in the defense department. Um, so back in those days, young people with no actual skills went into consulting, which is what I did. And along the way, I picked up some useful skills and eventually I started building applications at Oracle. So I am an application builder, not really a data scientist. But about five years ago, I started working on projects to get machine learning into Oracle's maintenance and repair apps. And there were and still are a lot of competing ML solutions within Oracle, um, including OML, which is of course the solution that, that we did end up uh, using for this solution. But back in those days, I wasn't actually working with OML and I got paired with a, a PhD data scientist from one of Oracle's other platforms. Um, and that data scientist told me that we should start with the data um, to decide what ML solution to build. And, and basically they told me to send over a spreadsheet with just a bunch of sample data and that they would come up with a great ML model to do something useful um, that would be very exciting. So as an application developer, like starting with the data sounded like a really bad idea. Um, and, and in fact, it, it's the same philosophy that, uh, you know, applications developers, including Oracle application developers, um, have, have suffered from and, and built many unusable apps. Uh, and I guess that's true in Oracle, but also outside Oracle. And it's one of the reasons that we see, you know, the rise of user-centric design and design thinking um, and, and why those are the more dominant paradigms in application development. But at the time I was a data science noob and in no position to argue with, you know, an expert with a PhD. So long story short, five years later and a lot of wasted effort later, uh, that first data first solution has zero customers and, and doesn't really work. So, um, you know, that's sort of my data point for starting with the data. So my recommendation is don't start with the data, right? Um, and so I want to start by understanding the business, right? Um, and, and I start with this, this anecdote to sort of lay out two themes of the presentation. And the first is that the recipe for success, I think, both in apps design as well as in data mining, is not starting with the data, but rather understanding the business and the users. And, and this is no revolutionary thought on my part, right? On the left-hand side, you see the, um, the crisp data mining model, which clearly starts with understanding the business. Uh, and that is the one starting point in the model. Uh, and on the right side, you see sort of the design thinking model, right? Start with empathy for your users. One is a data modeling process, one is an applications design process, but they really both start in the same place. And I take that as sort of a general consensus that um, that is the right place to start if you wanna succeed. So that's the first theme I wanted to sort of lay out before we go into the presentation. And of course, the second theme of the presentation is that you shouldn't just assume that experts are always right. So hopefully that's helpful as well. 
Okay, so let's start by understanding this business, right? So what is depot repair? It's not exactly a term that is a you know household word, um, but if you're in the industry, you hear it a lot. Um, but just like any bad presenter, I will start by reading from my slides. So depot repair, it is the repair, maintenance, or recycling of products returned by customers to a processing facility. And that can be compared and contrasted with field service, which involves the repair, maintenance, or recovery at a customer site or at an off-premise location. Um, and the deeper repair process and the application that we build, it is all about managing the tracking of each item that is returned from a customer to a repair center to its final disposition. And, and disposition is just a, a fancy word for what we finally do with it in the end, right? Do we send it back to the customer? Do we put it in a warehouse to use as replacement product for a new customer? Do we send it back to the supplier because it's broken? Do we send it to the recycler because we can't use it anymore? Um, you know, whatever it may be. And some common examples of repair depots, right? So if you are in the USA listening to this, you probably have a car, possibly multiples of them. But anytime you take a car, a bike, or any other vehicle to a shop for repairs, that is a depot repair. That, that shop might be managed by the company that sold you the vehicle, um, but it might also just be a partner of that company, an, an independent business, um, or it might be a completely independent business that has no relationship to the, the um, manufacturer that sold you the car or the bike or, or whatever it might be. Or another example, let's say I, I have a Garmin watch, right, and a, a GPS watch, and I break it. I can actually mail it back to Garmin, the manufacturer of the watch. They have a huge repair center in the middle of Kansas, and somebody who is a Garmin employee will fix it and send it back to me working. But I live in Europe, and so if I have an Apple watch and I break that Apple watch, Apple tells me to mail that watch back to Flextronics in the Netherlands, and Flextronics will repair it, and they'll send it back to me on behalf of Apple. But if I lived in the USA, if I broke my Apple Watch, I could go into a Best Buy big box retail store and go to their Apple authorized service provider desk, the, the Geek Squad basically, and they could fix that watch for me right there, right? So essentially in the depot business, you just have a lot of different business models and, and a lot of different ways that things can get repaired. And so the e-business suite depot repair application, which is the one that I'm focusing on today for this presentation, it supports the repair processes for all of these different business models. And any machine learning solution designed for repair has to understand the needs and characteristics of these different business models. So for example, again, going back to Garmin, that Garmin employee might only see 10 different products you know, 10 different you know, Garmin GPS watches that can come in um, and they're all manufactured by Garmin but they might repair lots of them, right? Maybe hundreds for each day. So they're gonna see the same 10 products over and over and over again. But that Flextronics employee, they might see 200 different products manufactured by 20 different companies because they are doing contract repair for Apple, possibly even for Garmin, for other companies as well. And so they might see one product a bunch of times, but there might be some products that come in that they only see once or twice ever, very rarely. And so the data footprints for these two different situations are going to be very, very different. Understanding repair technicians is also important to developing our machine learning solutions. So technicians love solving problems. They dislike data entry. They don't trust computers that tell them what to do unless those computers actually tell them why they're telling them what, what they should do. So a fundamental requirement that we had for any machine learning solution for a repair technician is to explain the reasoning behind any recommendation that we give them. And then we let the technician use their judgment to determine if that's the right answer or not. So if the system tells them what to do and tells them that they have to do it, they're gonna find a way to sabotage the system, right? Like they're gonna make it fail. Uh, we call that psychological reactance, by the way, which is a nice way of saying sabotage. So anyway, formalizing the list of tasks that a technician or, or any other user performs makes it very easy to see where machine learning can be applied to solve problems, right? So this was how we approached um, figuring out where to put machine learning into the system. We looked at all the things that our target user does, um, and then it just became very obvious where we could apply machine learning. So the, a, a very key part, in fact, what the technician does every day, repair after repair, is to just look at a broken product try to diagnose what's wrong with it, and then figure out the best way to fix it, right? Very simple, over and over and over again. But it's actually not simple because each of those products is different. Um, 
and they might be working on a very broad set of products, right? You know, so in Garmin, maybe they were only working on 10, but at Flextronics, maybe it's 200, right? Maybe it's even more. So some of these products are going to see sometimes a lot. Sometimes they're going to see them very rarely. And so they got to know how to fix all of them. And so on top of that, each product that comes back, let's say, you know, it's the Garmin watch that I see most frequently, but each one of them that comes in is going to have a different age. There's going to be different versions of that same watch. Each is going to have a different amount and type of usage, and it will be an, have been used under different conditions, which means that what went wrong with it could be very different in all of these different cases. And so, you know, each of the different products have different diagnostic steps, different ways that they can fail, different parts that might fail, and on and on, right? So I don't want to belabor the point, but there's a lot of variability here, right? Um, and that makes it very hard to predict things. So depending on the product, the customer, the warranty and other factors, not only is it hard to predict what failed, but sometimes figuring out the best solution might be whatever solution is fastest, no matter what the cost. You know, you might have a key customer that has a service level agreement that says, I just need it back fast. I don't care what it costs. But in other cases, you might be repairing things under warranty, in which case finding the lowest cost solution is the best fix. So again, very dependent on context, what the best option is here. So these problems are really good problems for machine learning, right? For a single human that works in that repair center to know all of the different variables here for the different products and, and the different factors that go into what, deciding what is the best fix is really hard. So if we had just started looking at the data rather than looking what the user does, we wouldn't really have known that the obvious problem that we want to fix with ML is how to diagnose and how to determine the best fix, right? So, okay, so that, that's enough. That's a little bit of a soapbox about, um, you know, why we should focus on users and not just on, on algorithms or, or on data. But for you data lovers out there, and I know there are many of you, uh, I can hear you asking, can we please finally look at the data? And of course the answer is yes. Um, so business applications, particularly ERP applications like the eBusiness Suite, they are very structured. And that is the point of them, to identify entities that are universally used in various types of businesses and to standardize those processes, um, but not only the processes, but the data and the KPIs. And so that allows companies like Oracle or SAP or Intuit or others um, that they can build software that allows all these different businesses to run their business on the same software. So even though every business is different, there's enough about each business that's the same or at least similar that most companies can use these business apps to run parts, if not all of their business. Now, admittedly, some of the most exciting parts of data science involve unstructured data. And it was conventional wisdom about five years ago that massively distributed file systems, MapReduce algorithms, unstructured data and machine learning was gonna be the end of relational databases in companies like Oracle. But that conventional wisdom has changed a little bit over the last few years. And even though structured data, maybe it's less cool, but it's now at least getting more appreciation for just how useful it can be, even in a world full of unstructured data. But just because data is structured, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's predictable. So the eBusiness Suite Depot Repair application, we currently have maybe about a thousand customers, right? And, and these customers are in all different industries and each customer has its own unique business and its own unique product set. A company like Motorola, for example, has huge repair centers to fix high volumes of, of cell phones. But a company like GE might have a workshop that works on just one or two turbines at a given time. Very different data footprint there. But Motorola might see thousands of Razer phones in a single day, but they might also have to repair just one or two, um, say, ruggedized two-way radio sets per week, right? And the phone might have only five to 10 components that fail regularly, but a radio set might have 40 to 50 components that fail regularly. So the shape of the data for the phone and the radio sets, they're going to be really different, right? Um, and so it kind of makes it a little harder to find the perfect machine learning model or an algorithm. Um, and so you have to be sensitive that, you know, all of these data sets are, are going to have a different shape. So with the eBusiness suite, right, we're building business apps and the business apps, they have to work for GE, they have to work for Motorola. And of course, those other, you know, approximately 998 other businesses that we support. So how do we deal with that, right? So let, I'll put that question on hold and bring up another factor. And it's, Often we talk about machine learning and maintenance, 
the default is to assume that it's based on IoT data streams, right? And detecting anomalies in continuous streams of data. When you have IoT censored products and, and you have access to those data streams, that is the right answer, right? You want that. That is the best way to, to figure out when products are going to fail and what failed and, and whatnot. Um, and IoT and machine learning are just fantastic together, right? Just like peanut butter and jelly. But as recently as two years ago at our service apps customer advisory board, we polled our customers and found that almost none of them had any IoT data from their products that they could use for repair. That doesn't mean those customers can't use machine learning, but the type of machine learning that they need to do is very different than people using IoT data streams. Each time a product fails, it creates a snapshot of data, right? There is a repair record and we capture what failed, how it failed, what we did to fix it. And if you can capture enough of those snapshots, machine learning can start to detect patterns and glean insights from all of those snapshots. But that only works if you have a lot of snapshots. So going back to our earlier example, that might mean that Motorola can make good use of machine learning for its extremely high volume Razer phones, but maybe can't take advantage of it for their low volume two-way radio data sets. And GE surely will not have enough snapshots of turbine failures because they just don't fail that often and there just aren't that many of them. But thankfully, GE turbines do have lots of IoT sensors and they can use those for their machine learning. But again, to build machine learning into business apps like EBS Depot Repair, the machine learning has to work for GE and it has to work for Motorola and a bunch of other customers. So how do we deal with that? Okay, so let's talk about that. I should mention EBS Depot Repair has many different modules. For example, there's a technician module, a manager module, receiving clerk module, data analyst tools, and so much more. But for this session, I'm only going to focus on the repair te technician portal that you see in the snapshot on the screen here. Depending on your age, you might remember something called a clipboard, which was a piece of wood or plastic with a clip on the top to hold papers so you could write on them. In the old days, a worker in a repair shop would have a clipboard with a piece of paper attached that they could carry around as they did the repairs. And that piece of paper would have check boxes they could check off, right? Cause of failure, what parts they replaced, what they did. Um, the clipboard was a very user-centric design system, right? It provided exactly the decision support the technician needed and didn't require them to write anything down, which is exactly what they didn't want to do. They don't want to do data entry, right? So oftentimes, even, in, even now, in a lot of businesses, technicians still walk around with clipboards and paper, and those businesses are paying people to do the data entry from the clipboard and paper in the system. So we took that as a hint and we designed a system that metaphorically is a clipboard, right? So it lays out in front of the technician, all the diagnostic codes, all the service codes, all the information they need to capture. And they can just with a finger tap the tablet or the touchscreen and say which particular diagnostic code that they see, which, which one applies, which service code are they gonna perform and, and so on and so forth, right? And so they, they really like that metaphor, low data entry. Here we see that you can do, the screen is laid out. So there's three tabs that correspond to the different um, steps of the process, right? During evaluation, you capture diagnostic codes. It's what the technician sees. And then they're going to determine how to fix it. And that is a service code. OK, uh, then there are two other tabs, execution, which is where you, know, you indicate what, what did I do? What parts do I use? And then finally, there is a debrief tab where I indicate, okay, what was the root cause of the failure? And again, with one finger, I can click that little checkbox and, and you know, I can see what failed there. Now, finally, notice at the top of the screen on each of these screens, there is a button for a page called recommendations, third from the left. That button pops up the machine learning recommendations page, which looks like this. So this is the, the sort of heart of the presentation and it's taken me a while to get here, but now we're actually talking about machine learning, right? So this screen supports two recommendation. It can predict the best fix or the service code as we saw in the last tab, and it can predict the root cause or the defect code. It uses predictors like the item, the item revision, the item age, the diagnostic codes entered by the technician. And then it can also do text mining to glean predictors from the technician notes, the service agent notes, anything the customer entered as well. On the screenshot, we see a table. Each row is a recommendation in that table. That includes the status. So did the technician see this before? Is it new, viewed, accepted, or rejected? And there's a column for the type of recommendation. Right now, there's only two types of recommendation. Um, you can predict service code. You can predict root cause code, right? But it's architected so in the future, you can add more different types of recommendation um, without having to change the screen. There is a reference to a specific service code or defect code and a recommendation that says, 
market as applicable. There is the confidence, which comes directly from OML, that says how confident are we in this prediction. And there's insight, which also comes from OML, telling us, you know, how did we come about this prediction, right? And again, we'd mentioned before, this user needs to know why am I being given a recommendation so that I, I basically support it or don't sabotage it, right? Um, the decision drop list you see here allows the technician to accept or reject that recommendation. If they accept it, that recommendation marking the service code or defect code as applicable is automatically done in those screens we looked at just a second ago. And I'll show that again. If they reject it, they can enter the reason from a list of values why they rejected it and even provide additional comments, hopefully creating, well, actually right now it only creates an audit log, right? It's so that we have a record of why they rejected something. But hopefully in the future, we could actually use that information as a feedback loop to make better recommendations. Okay, so let's assume that we accepted a recommendation and we've populated the, uh, in the red box, you can see that there are uh, the check boxes and here we've decided to replace the hard disk. So that got checked. I can click, there's a button right above that table that says generate jobs. By clicking that button, I can then generate all of the tasks and materials and resources I need for replacing the hard disk. So that's awesome. It kills off a lot of data entry. I could also have chosen a recommendation that says, you know, capture the root cause. And here I've captured one that says motherboard damaged, right? So, um, you know, I can see that populated here. So um, that's essentially it, right? So, and, and we'll go to live demo of this if we have a little time left, um, but that's all it does. So all the action is actually on the back end, right? So let me talk you through what happens on the back end. Where did these recommendations come from? So. This is the nut of it, and, and I'll try to cover this in about five minutes, and then we can go do questions and answers and look at live screens. Um, but really, the work that we mainly had to do to make these OML APIs work, first we needed to create views that specifically included our targets and our predictors from all of our historical repair records. Now, this turned out to be a lot more complicated for us than you might expect, because our target values were not always singletons, meaning a single repair might have two causes, or it might even have three different ways to fix it. So that turns out to be really complex. So I'm going to just gloss over it now, but happy to talk about it in Q&A if anybody's interested how we dealt with that problem, because it was a lot harder than I thought. Data preparation was done almost entirely by OML's ADP or by OML's algorithms themselves. So for example, one-hot encoding, numerical scaling, missing value imputation, those are all done by ADP, automatic data preparation. But feature selection, data balancing, and outlier management were actually handled differently by different algorithms during model creation. And using different algorithms is one of the more interesting parts of this solution. So I talked before about how the data footprint for each business is unique and different. But not only is the data footprint different across businesses, it also different between you know, each of the products. So you know, some have frequent repairs, some not. Some have long lifespans, some don't. Some have multiple configuration, others don't, and so on. So some algorithms work well with small data sets and others don't. Um, some work better with heterogeneous data, sparse data, high cardinality data. But as a product designer, I, I don't know which algorithm is best suited for each of my customers and certainly don't know for each of their products. But the customer's data knows that. So our solution approach was not to provide a best algorithm, best model, but rather to provide factories to generate models and then let those models compete with each other to see which was best for each specific data set. So Motorola might use an SVM model to make predictions on their Razor phones, but a decision tree model to make predictions about their two-way radios. And maybe they use Naive Bayes to make predictions about other products, right? So this was a very manually coded, very simplified version of what OML provides in their AutoML feature, but because we didn't have that feature available when we built this, we had to build it manually. So we only used three different algorithms that relied entirely on OML to do their hyperparameters and to do the data preparation. And we only relied on basically the area under the curve, ROC, AUC, to decide which was the winning model. Again, very simple, but the hope is in the future, maybe we move up to auto ML when we have access to it. So in addition to the problem of variable data shape, there's also the problem of concept drift, right? So today is Tuesday, but if Motorola chose the best model for predicting the cause of failure in Razer phones last Tuesday, that means there might have been 10,000 or more Razers repaired in that week. So is last Tuesday's winning model still the best model now that we have 10,000 new records? We could analyze each model to make sure it's still current, but that's complicated. And so we basically just provided the option to regenerate the model selectively and, and basically whenever the customer wanted to. Um, 
And we recommend they regenerate them as frequently as they're willing to do so that they always have fresh models and they always know that that is the winning model. Now in the future, again, we'd like to be more clever and we'd like to you know, possibly uh, be able to more selectively choose which models are getting unfresh and replace them. But for right now, we have a solution that works. So we also provide the option to choose specific algorithms instead of, instead of always competing. So if SVM models, like they're very slow, very data intensive, and so really hard to generate them, right? So maybe as a business, I only want to generate a naive Bayes model because uh, I trust those. Or maybe I know that SVMs always win with my critical data. So I choose just to use SVMs. And then finally, the solution also provides options to go back as far in history as you want, right? So, you know, it, does it make sense to go back three years? Has my data been consistent for three years? Or have there been changes in, in the business that require me to only look at the last six months or so? You know, I can choose a different time horizon when generating those models. So let me stop there. I am one minute away from the half hour. And, and I know I said I was going to try to do this in 20. Somehow I got late. But I'm going to stop. Marcos did mention that we can actually go a little bit over. So for those willing to stay and still interested, let's please do Q&A. For those that have to go, thank you for your attendance here. And, and um, uh, hopefully we can talk more about maintenance later. OK, so I will stop there. Um, Marcos, do you want to jump in and uh, maybe talk about what's in the Q&A? Sure, excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Lee. That, that was a very, very uh, interesting presentation. And we have uh, one of the questions is, are the ML models trained for each uh, of the customers for their own data set? Or does EBS use pre-trained models to give repair recommendations for any customer? Yeah, good question. And, and no pre-trained models at all. What we are sending out is we are sending out basically code that works as a factory to generate models for the customer based on their own data. And that's all it does, right? So it looks at that data as the source of truth. And it can basically figure out from that, what is, you know, how would I build a, a best model in an SV, SVM or in a naive Bayes model or in a decision tree model? And then it sort of lets them fight it out with, you know, based on, you know, what has the best area under the curve of those models. Excellent. Um, thank you very much. Uh, guys, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A. And if not, Ali, I think we will have to invite you back for the maintenance portion because <laughs> it was really a very cool presentation and I think uh, a lot of people liked it. So oh, thank you very much. I should mention that if folks are interested in seeing the live demo, uh, I'd be happy to provide it. But there is also a link back when we looked at this recommendations page to a YouTube demo that basically shows the same demo that I would show you live. So please feel free to go back and click on that link and take a look at the demo. Perfect. Thank you very much. And, and I'll share the slides as well so they, they'll be able to see the link there. So there's another quick question here. How do we handle the uh, M times N problem with the data relations? So, so the, the question is, you mentioned the problem has, has that one problem has more than one solution. Uh, OK, so it's the question that I asked in the beginning. <laughs> OK, so that is complicated. Um, actually, so Detlef, let me please I can't answer that question, but it's going to take a little time. Let me please answer. There are questions from Abhijit and from anonymous attendee. And let me just quickly answer those because I think those are fast ones to answer and yours is a slow one to answer. OK, so Abhijit asks, how do you deal with the cold start issue if enough data is not available to provide repair recommendations? Um, that one's actually, you know, the cold start issue you know, is huge for us, right? Because we need lots of snapshots before we can make good recommendations. But we also threshold our recommendations, right? So basically, we don't start making recommendations until we're past the cold start. So uh, essentially, the repair technician is just going to keep doing their job until there's enough data to make a recommendation. And one thing I should say is, you know, I'm, I'm beating to death the Motorola example. Um, but, you know, if I have razor phones where I have lots and lots of, of evidence, right? Lots and lots of, of cases of past failures. You know, it's easy for me to get past that cold start problem. But if I have a much less common product, I may never get past the cold start problem. I may never be able to make a good recommendation for particular models. And if that is the case, then the system does not make a recommendation. Uh, it will only recommend when it meets the threshold of sort of goodness of model and goodness of confidence. 
uh, and anonymous attendee asks, how many variables can be taken as input for the model? Um, is there a limit? So um, I assume when you mean variables, we're talking specifically about um, feature selection. And I should say that the features are sort of pre-selected. Um, and, and so we're not actually allowing the customers to do a lot of like, hey, we use this, you know, this attribute that other customers may not use. That's one of sort of the luxuries of being an ERP application where we have canonical data models, right? So, you know, we know, uh, you know, here are the 50 or so attributes that are used at essentially every customer that does repair. And, you know, every customer has a couple of other attributes that maybe, you know, they consider important, but others don't. But those sort of canonical ones, we know that those features are always going to be included in the prediction set. But the algorithms themselves, right, within OML, OML is going to do feature pruning. OML is going to basically decide which of those features are most predictive. So we create a view where we have all of those attributes, and OML makes the decisions of which ones to use when it actually builds the model. OK, and then let me do, uh, Darmender is asking, what work is done by OML versus Depot Repair? Does OML work like ATG, where Depot Repair is updating the features and functionality provided by OML? Um, yeah, so basically, yes, OML is, is like ATG. OML to us is a service, right? We call those APIs, and those APIs do a bunch of stuff for us. Depot Repair doesn't have to do a lot of the work, right? So what Depot had to do in the beginning was to create the views that said, the, these are the cases that we're dealing with, right? So, you know, we're going to take a bunch of old repair orders, the repair order history, and these are the attributes that we want OML to basically look at and decide which are most predictive. So in, in that regard, OML is really just, it, it's an external API call. It is a service to us. But the luxury is, you know, we didn't have to do any sort of real ETL program, right? We just defined a view in the same database where uh, we actually have our transactional data. And one nice luxury we have is that, you know, compared to, um, you know, say Oracle order management or even Oracle manufacturing, where you have unbelievable numbers of data records, in most cases, you always have less things failing than you have building. So unless you are a business that specifically all and only does repairs, we are not overwhelmed by the amount of data in the database, meaning it's, it's uh, you know, smaller database sizes than, than others deal with. Oh, uh, actually, Sanji, that, that I, I may have just answered that question, but let me to reiterate, um, how do we get the EBS data into the platform? Um, so the platform is just the database. And, and OML, I, I should have mentioned early on, and I don't think I did, this e-business suite is an on-premise application. This is not the cloud, um, the cloud suite, um, which we'll talk about next time when we talk about maintenance. We'll talk about you know the maintenance cloud. So the EBS data is actually in the database. The OML processing is actually in the database. So we never move the data. The data is there. Um, we create a view on it, and OML operates against that that view. Um, so Sanjeev is asking what data preparation is involved. Let me, oh, I actually have the slide up that tells what data preparation is involved. Um, so, so Sanjeev, just to reiterate what's in the slide, right? I mean, there is categorical value encoding, and I believe by default it's using one hot encoding. We scaled our numerical values, right? Again, that's done by ADP, the automatic data preparation feature of OML. Um, we imputed missing values. Again, that's not depot repair. It's actually in the ADB feature of Oracle Machine Learning. And, and it was the algorithms that did the data uh, preparation um, while building the models, right? So um, when we use OML to build our you know, SVM model, the SVM model itself, as it's being built, dealt with the imbalanced data. It dealt with choosing the features and it dealt with the outliers, you know, just as an example. Okay, and apologies to Detlef, who is hopefully still very patiently waiting. Um, I wasn't expecting more questions. So uh, the question from Abhijit is, is the transactional data history enough to train the ML model? Or do you need to pull the transactional data into a data warehouse using ETL so you can train the models on more historical data? And how training ML model on AGP impacts the database performance? Okay, so um, there's actually a couple of components here to unpack. So yes, the transactional data history in almost every case is enough to train the ML model. Um, and in fact, if a technician is doing repair, one of the things that they always have at their fingertips is the repair history for this given asset and the repair history for assets like it. So 
in the transactional database, we always keep um, a number of historical repair records because the technician really needs that data at their fingertips when they're doing repairs. And this also gets to the other point that I made before, which is that you don't generally have an overwhelming amount of repair history data. So, you know, if you are Amazon and you have an order management system on the Amazon platform, you know, you're going to have to offload that data very regularly because you would quickly fill up almost any data store, transactional data store and slow it down if you did not. But in a repair center, even if it's processing a very high volume, you can get away with keeping six months or a year, or in some cases, you know, three years or more of data if it's not such high volume without having to offload it to a data warehouse. And so the fact that all of this is in the database makes it a perfect fit for using OML in the database. Okay, so let me jump back to Detlef's question. Hopefully, Abhijit, that answered it. Um, so Detlef, the complexity here was that when we were trying to predict, and I, I'll just use um, root cause code as the example here. Um, when we designed the system, we actually provided the flexibility to allow users to choose multiple root cause codes. In retrospect, it would have made everything a lot easier if we had restricted them to a single root cause code, at least for making predictions, or if, um, we had actually chosen as our first effort in using OML to be a different attribute, which is only a singleton attribute, which did not allow multiple, um, multiple different options. So there were actually multiple different ways to solve this. And what we realized was that if we solved it in what we thought was the most obvious way, which was to um, basically uh, every time we see an example of, you know, um, root cause one and root cause two, to basically just increment the number of root cause ones in the bucket of root cause ones that are associated to, to this type of failure and to increment bucket two of you know, root cause twos for all of the uh, root causes for failures that might happen here. But what we, we were educated by, um, thankfully the folks in the OML group was that, well, as you do that, you're basically just nullifying root cause one with root cause two, right? If you treat these as sort of if you look at it from a, you know, again, a, a one hot encoding type situation, um, there's no way really to conjoin these. So you're basically just wiping out the incidences where you have cause one and cause two together. And so statistically speaking, it was actually better to um, just randomly choose when you had cause one and cause two, whether you were going to use cause one and cause two because of the low frequency with which these conjoined root causes actually happen. Basically, you're at least incrementing one of, incrementing one of those root causes so that the next time you see it, it is represented in the one-hot encoding and not being nullified in the one-hot encoding. So, um, I think if we can bring on a real data scientist to answer that question, we can certainly do a better justification of it. I think pictures might help somewhere. I actually have pictures of when we were sussing this all out. Um, and, and I'll be happy to follow up with more detail on that. Or maybe Marcos or, or even uh, Mark or Sherry, who actually were some of the people that helped us figure out this problem, could provide more detail into it that, that will make it clearer than, than I just did. Uh, thank you, Lee. You know, I think hopefully that was uh, clear enough. Um... If that left wants more more details or, or needs more information, uh, you know, at any time uh, he can reach out. And actually, any any time you guys have uh, specific questions, you guys can go to Ask Tom and um, ask a question directly there, so that we can tackle that in the next session as well. Um, so feel free to do that. So thank you very much, Lee. Um, we are almost fifteen minutes after, but uh, it, it was a great session. Um, and there's a lot of people still here. They want to see your uh, YouTube link for, for the live demo. Um, oh, okay. Let me scroll back. Yeah. So I'm going back to slide number, where are my slide numbers? Slide number 11. And you'll see in the upper right-hand corner, there is a YouTube link there. All right. Excellent. And then, uh, well, that's it. People ask, uh, just saying thank you and... Um, appreciating you for uh, for the presentation and for answering uh, the questions. So All right, thank uh, you everybody and thanks for the great questions too. That was great. And thanks thanks so thanks a lot Lee. Uh, thank you guys. See you guys next week. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.